somebody, I forget his name. He asked me to do something for money. And he said, he gave me a hundred bucks. And I, you know, started a PayPal. And I still remember to this day looking at PayPal and seeing a hundred dollars in there for customizing <laughs> that, doing something I wanted for once in life and getting paid yeah. for it was like probably one of the best moments uh, I, I oh. ever had. So that, that set a fire, like an, uh, like a nuclear explosion under my ass. And I was just like, I can do this. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 30. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. We have an interesting interview on this show, but first I do want to remind you that our podcast, the Knife Junkie Podcast, is brought to you by... By Audible. If you love audio like Bob and I do, you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial just by going to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Just uh, our way of saying thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And Bob, another uh, knife designer, knife maker, if you will, but uh, really a, a knife artist that uh, you're going to be having a chance to talk to on this show. Yeah, yeah. In my opinion, he really is. Um, Jeff Blauvelt. You, you ever have a song, uh, Jim, something by Led Zeppelin, maybe, that you're like, man, I wish I wrote that song. Or if I were, a, you know, a, a rock and roll songwriter, I would have written that song. Well, mm -hmm. when I look at his knives, that's how I feel. Mm. They're beautiful. They're art. They're functional art, of course. But uh, something about him uh, really resonates with me, and he's very prolific. I mean, mm. every day it seems like there's a new masterpiece coming out on Instagram. Right. Right. So I just had to get him on and talk to him. Well, and I do want to let our uh, our listeners know that uh, we would have had Jeff on, what, a month or more ago? In fact, we, yep. we thought we did. We had a uh, you had a great conversation with him, but um, as you said in the newsletter this past week, uh, a glitch, some kind of technical something, oh, and yeah. the the audio quality just came out so bad. It uh, you know it was unfortunate because it was a great conversation, but I think this is going to be a great conversation. I just uh, have yeah, no I doubt. I think we because, redeemed it. Yeah, for yeah, sure. You guys, you guys kind of just click, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, there's a little bit of the Philly connection. There's a little bit of the art school connection, and uh, yeah, his, his knives are just outstanding. And uh, that interview is coming up next right here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments. I wanted to congratulate you on the uh, Switch model coming out, Custom Knife Factory. Yeah, they're here. They got them for sale. I think they did like the first 20 or something, and then... Uh... They said they sold out faster than any other model, which is pretty cool. Than any other custom knife factory model? Um, that's what they said, and you know everybody seems to like it. So uh, how do you feel about it as a representation of your custom switch? It's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty freaking perfect. I mean, it definitely probably works better than one of mine because it's, you know, made with multi-million dollar machines. and Right. And each time it's the same. Yeah, it's, it's very smooth and very nice. There's... I have a couple questions about some things they chose, but for the most part, I mean, I couldn't be happier. I know you do most of your designing free, uh, not freehand, but you're a draftsman. You draw. Yeah. So how did they? Uh, how did you give them this design? Did you send them an actual example and they break it down from there, or did you learn CAD? Or well, what? usually I rely on like with my art form stuff. I rely on a a customer that's like a friend. I'll just be like, hey, can I mm -hmm. take this and send it to Russia for a year? And usually they're like, yeah. So I took my buddy's model. They still have it for some odd reason. Oh. Um, and they basically did that. I, I took a bunch of pictures of some edits I made to it because that one wasn't my favorite one out of all of them. Because, you know, I make each mm -hmm. one separately. So even though they're the same, I do like minor adjustments as I design the knife or make the knife. So, you know, I sent them a really detailed picture of what I wanted changed on it, which was interesting how they did a perfect job of taking my pictures and actually applying to the uh, the model they had and changing wow. it up. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's that's that's what I try to do. I mean, most people send like a CAD file. But I, mm -hmm. I have no idea how to use that, and um, I don't know how to do math or spell or read. <laughs> all of this, all of this makes me feel so yeah, good. Is, yeah, <laughs> I don't know what a ruler is or what are those things? Calipers? Yeah. I've heard yeah. of them, but yeah, you know, pencil <laughs> and paper. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And I use rocks to grind the knives. I just bang on them. You know, it takes a while. But... <laughs> yeah. Anyone who would do less is less than a man. I exactly. Suppose. 
So how'd you get into making knives? I, I, I used to watch you on uh, YouTube. You did a lot of knife modifications for people and you did these epic long videos that were great where you would sort of show off uh, the most recent 12 knives you've you've tweaked. Yeah, that was crazy. I also poured over a, a video, a, a, a two part video you did about uh, making Emerson scales. And I, I watched it for a while. I was like, I'm going to do that. And then after a while, was, was like, that Man. the uh, like the really <laughs> old video on how to make really old? Is... Like you're sitting, you're sitting on a cool. I've like updated and... the description of that. Like, do not follow this. This is <laughs> just BS and it is totally wrong. Cause I mean, that was like, that read. was so long <laughs> before I actually, like that was before I had like a drill press. I mean, right, like yeah. it was, and I'm, I keep it up there just cause I don't care. Like, you know what I mean? Like all this stuff's up there on my YouTube channel. Some of it's the most cringy thing you'll ever see in your life, but I like it. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't mind. It's like, there's a growth there. If you watch all the videos, um, yeah, if you yeah. have like two years to spend watching videos of me, it's your biographer. I mean, why get it's rid my of history? I mean, it literally is. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really weird. And someday I'll go back and watch all of them if they don't get, you know, taken off of YouTube for having music in the background. When you're, when your children force you to watch yeah. them. No, nah, my wife has never watched a single video. Really? I told her she couldn't. <laughs> and she never did, actually. But, you know, like... That's, that's what she said. Yeah, anyway. I, like, it was, it was, you know, it was, you know, I was a little shy about it. You know, I had to put music on in the background because the quiet was, like, too awkward for me. So right. I never made a dime off of a single YouTube video, except for, you know, oh, launching man. my career, which is totally fine with me. So, yeah, yeah, right. yeah it, it, exactly. it paid for itself pretty much. So, you know, it's not like I was doing huge production or anything. How, how did it happen that you went from an art student to someone who is uh, people were entrusting their five hundred dollar knives to to tweak and to make cool to someone who's making beautiful and I hesitate to say art knives because they seem way more useful than just an art knife. Yeah, it's a mixture between the two. Yeah, yeah. So how did that uh, evolution uh, occur? You know, I was an artist, air quotes. I ha always hated that label because the people around me like annoyed the hell out of me because artists are kind of douchebags <laughs> for the most part. Um, yeah, I never liked the, the art scene, I guess. Like I had a couple galleries of my paintings and I just, I could not stand like these people around me. Like people would draw a triangle on a piece of paper with like some rainbows on it. And like, it was like, oh my God, this is like so-and-so. And he's like this great artist. He was homeless once. I'm like, <laughs> congratulations, you can't draw or paint. But yeah, like, um, I just wanted to do something creative with my life and art was a, is a dead end. I mean, anybody who's into art, unless you're doing graphic design really well in that most saturated market on the planet, you're pretty much going to fail unless you're, you know, hit by lightning or something. So I kind of realized that. And I always liked actually making things, uh, more original, I guess, like taking something I own and, you know, customize like a skateboard. I used to paint on skateboards for a company. And, um, I basically, you know, I, I was delivering pizza at the time and I started carrying a knife. My first knife was a Smith & Wesson knockoff. And, um, you know, I liked carrying knives uh, at that point. I never really did. I had, you know, Swiss Army knives for my grandpa, like, when I was little. But he never really cared much about them or thought of them as anything I needed, really, to live my life. But I started carrying, like, this crappy knife, and I really liked it. It was a flipper. And I started kind of watching YouTube videos of, like, Cutlery Lover and Nothing Fancy. Mm -hmm. And, the yeah, yeah, they were... Awesome. Nothing fancy. I actually shouted out my channel when the first like hmm. two months I had a YouTube channel, which made me basically crap my pants. And I mean, he was, you know, he was back in the day. He was, yeah, he kind of got a little fool of himself after time. You know, no offense, nothing fancy, but you know, you're like the most fool of yourself guy out there. But you know, he's the grandfather of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, I still watch his shot show footage every year because it's exciting. But I, I would uh, look around the forums at knives. I started looking at blade forums and I saw customizing handles and stuff like that. And uh, I decided to try that out after starting my collection. And the first one I messed with was a uh, Spyderco Tenacious. Uh, I said mm -hmm. the plain G10 scales and I thought they were pretty boring. And uh, Yen Zanzo was the first custom maker. I actually saw pictures of their knives. Or, you know, I was like, what the hell is that? And the Anzo mm -hmm. pattern was so... Uh, I mean, it just, it made my, my whole life like change when I saw it. Uh, so just dis describe the answer. Uh, it's pattern. like basically like grooves coming in from both sides, meeting in the middle, like teeth, like alternating. And, uh, this is on a handle he, scale. We're yeah. On, on G10 handles. And like the G10 has a grain to it. And he, I found out later he would like sandblast the G10, which would bring out the grain more. Cause you know, I was mm. trying to figure out how to do that the way he does it. So it was just so clean. And like, you know, back then that, that was like the shit yeah and it feels really yeah, good when yeah you grip it. yeah exactly so i i wanted to do that and i basically in my house no mask indoors 
windows closed um <laughs> with like a hand drill and like uh with the oven on and, and the door exactly open. with yeah. like a uh like a little rock bit for like sharpening like chains i don't know right. yeah. you know i just did it was terrible but like i i want you know it looked good enough for me to be like i want to do this and then um yeah the youtube was uh youtube originally was just reviews of cut like hand, like production knives that i would buy like cheap knives and mm -hmm. um yeah i did the tenacious i think i showed i don't even remember but i think people were like wow that's cool and um i got the idea to start doing youtube videos of the customization by the fact that there was zero videos of that and barely any pictures besides on the specialized areas in the forums like sub forums with mm -hmm. pimp knives i guess you call them at the time so you were you were searching for how-to videos basically so you could accelerate your own skill and you weren't there definitely it. was no how-to anything there as far as that goes mm -hmm. i mean a lot of the the guys that were modding knives back then i mean i'm not afraid to say it because none of them are around anymore they were assholes like i mean they, they, <laughs> i mean maybe it's because they were the only ones doing it um, but mm -hmm. they did not want to give me the time of day, which is strange because any knife maker you talk huh. to now, they will yeah. basically, you know, give you the shirt off their back. Like most makers are just, they just love to just talk to people and help them out. So it's different now, I guess. But, you know, knife modding, that whole community was terrible. I mean, they, they were mm -hmm. so bad. I mean, <laughs> it was a lot of people like just because it, you know, it was a really weird thing and not a lot of people did it. And we're kind of all sharing the same customers back then. So it was like, and a couple of people disappeared if oh, I yeah. remember correctly yeah. with, with the property of others. And uh, yes, that was uh, that was a thing, but not to jump ahead too much. I decided mm -hmm. to try this out. I was unemployed because of the job I had as a scenic artist artist was like so off and on. And, um, scenic, uh, you mean in theater? Um, or? like I did like the please touch museum in Philadelphia. If you, if you oh, go there, yeah. there's a whole cityscape of Philadelphia, like a whole miniature Philadelphia. I did basically every brick on the wall was hand painted. All this, all the oh. trees and everything, I painted all that. So if you go there, that's a that's a tough knives custom uh, exhibit. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed it. You know what I mean? It was terrible pay, but yeah. and the job, you know, the the work was off and on. So it was just I decided to try this out, and I bought a Dremel and. Uh, I basically sat there in front of a fan with a Dremel and ordered some Jade G10 because I thought Jade was the coolest thing and started just messing mm -hmm. around and showing videos and pictures of it. And somebody, I forget his name, he asked me to do something for money. And he said he'd give me a hundred bucks and I, you know, started a PayPal. And I still remember to this day looking at PayPal and seeing a hundred dollars in there for customizing, <laughs> doing something I wanted for once in life and getting paid yeah. for it was like probably one of the best moments. Uh, I ever oh. had so that that set a fire like a uh, like a nuclear explosion under my ass and I was just like I can do this so skipping ahead you know I was doing them and the the paramilitary two came out and it was the most popular knife on the face of the earth and nobody customized them because they had milled nested liners yeah <laughs> what a pain in, and and also the uh, the uh, um, lanyard hole is a pain yeah, in the ass to deal everything with. about that was a pain in the ass but I agreed to try to do one and um. I was in the shop from, I say, 9 a.m. to 4 a.m. Um, no, no bullshit. And I was in it. You know, like I didn't talk to anybody the whole time. I don't think I ate either, but I, I did it all by hand. I milled out G10 scales by hand, wow. uh, which is ridiculous. You mean like with a little chisel or something? I think like I had like a uh, like some kind of a um, like an end mill that came with like a Dremel or something. It was like serrated on the bottom, but flat barrel, like quarter inch. And I think I just set the depth on the drill press. Oh into the scale because there is a path you can go in um on the paramilitaries and i just kind of shaved it away slowly on a flat table and it, it took forever but it actually worked and i i um ashamed of myself for this but i did take money up front but back in the day there was no rules really i mean it kind of so what what is that rule tell me about that uh, taking money up front is basically they pay before you're done the work which is the big problem that came up with the knife customization community was people would take money up front and you think you could do something uh, so you basically enter a contract like guarantee it's going to be done at this point you know what i mean and you don't realize being a small business owner just starting out that like it, it's it, it, everything gets in the way like everything goes like if someone says it'll take two weeks it's going to take three months you know what i mean mm -hmm. but so yeah. that's what happened and people would take way too many orders and because it's so easy just to take an order yeah i would get like 50 mm -hmm. 60 emails a day and people were willing to shell out the cash up front and um you know i kept up with it luckily but uh, yeah, it was very easy to like destroy your your business real fast with uh, taking money up front. So it's kind of seen as like a, a pretty much a no no no, or for years now. Well, I, I have to admit, I I um, 
back in 2008, I guess, or nine, uh, I I fell victim to being stupid, basically, and not doing my own due diligence. And I sent uh, a knife maker who was who made this really cool tactical version of a Filipino blade. And I wanted a different Filipino blade because, you know, they have millions of them. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, I asked him if he could make it. He's like, sure, I'm going to need this much. And what do you want me to make it out of? And, you know, I had this whole menu of materials and I was all uh, swept up by that. (laughs) And I picked out my knife and I sent him my money and I never heard back from him. And then I was constantly, you know, haunting blade forums and saw all these things about him. I was like, I'm such an idiot. I should have done my research. Yeah. I mean, mean, some of those guys, like I, I, when, when these guys would, would mess up like that. I understood it completely, man. I mean, it was, it's a horrible thing that like, that's why I would tell people not to do it. Like when people said they wanted to start modifying knives for a living, I'd be like, if you do it, you have to have the most discipline that you could possibly have. Cause it is hmm. very, very easy to screw up and start getting uh, overwhelmed with orders. And, and they, then people deal with it in like a couple different ways. I dealt with it by just never doing anything, but working and making sure that even though I was behind the ball here, I had to finish this stuff. So screw everything else. Yeah. I'm going to sit in the shop all day, every day until I get done. Other guys, they would just run and hide and disappear. And that, yeah. that happened a few times. And that's, it, it's bizarre to me, but yeah, there's still guys that I, I used to talk to all the time that just vanished off the face of the earth. Cause they took a bunch of money. Oh, yeah. Geez. And I know they didn't do it and they, they I know they didn't want to do that, but it just ended up that way. Yeah. That's how they get scared, you know? Yep. Yep. Well, I, I knew that you had turned a corner just in casually watching your videos when you accepted someone's strider and you took a uh, a regular drop point and turned it into a warning. Oh, Terra Fanatic? I, I don't yeah, remember it was, if it was Terra Fanatic. He put up but... a video on Instagram the other day, actually, because, you know, that was the first time I ever talked to him. Um, yeah, that was uh, a bizarre thing. I mean, I saw the, 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 <laughs> the strider warning. Like, basically, mm-hmm. when, you, when you start off like that, what I was doing, you don't know that custom knives are actually like, if you mess with a custom knife, it's like walking into an art exhibit and painting over someone's painting. You know what I mean? Yeah. I saw it as, oh, this guy bought a knife and he wants it to make it even more his own, you know? But, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, I did like maybe three or four custom knives I actually modified and I regret them to this day. Mm. And I get shit for it still. And I understand it and I deserve it. Good humored shit, I hope. Uh, some yes, some no. Some will hate <laughs> me forever. But, you know, I, I, I apologize and, you know, did what I could. And I told them all, you know, any warranty work that goes on, it's now on me. So, you know what I mean? Like, I, I now am responsible for that knife by that maker. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much what we had to do. So, but yeah, you don't you don't want to do that ever. <laughs> but yeah, the modifying knives thing, it was it was dangerous, man. I mean, you, it's a lot of little amounts of money and a lot of work. Like, and I realized quickly when I started making knives that making a folder actually took less time than making custom scales in some cases. Really? Yeah. I mean, cause replicating factory machines and making these, like you have to be perfect. I mean, you have to do all the counterbores exactly the same as the machinery and spider coast factory. All these things have to be absolutely spot on. So the screws don't go into deep. Yeah. Or so no, instead of doing the same uh, depth for your counterbores and every custom folder you're making you have to change it every single time for every single model and have every single type of screw sitting around because you're going to break them because they're usually garbage screws on most knives right. and yeah it's uh it's a it was it was way too much work i mean i loved it but it, you know i could tell there was there was a uh, it was dangerous and there wasn't much of a future in it so how did you go from from uh, using a dremel on factory g10 handle scales to actually grinding blades and creating your well, own? well you work? know common sense you know I mean, first it was like, I want to do this so I can buy more knives. I mean, that honestly Mm -hmm. is pretty much the goal of everybody who did that back then. But it was then I need to buy more equipment. And, uh, you know, Harbor Freight is kind of like the lord and savior of most people starting out. I mean, they're great. I mean, you know, it's garbage, but at the same time, there's some gems in there. You know what I mean? The, the, Mm -hmm. the, what was it? The one by 32 grinder, the green or one by, well, I don't forget what it is. The little grinder. Everybody had that thing. Uh What was the question again? I forgot. <laughs> I can't through there. I forgot <laughs> I what I was saying. Well, I was just wondering how you how you went from grinding factory uh, handle scales and, and and doing that to actually grinding blades, like not just blades, but very complicated looking, unique blades. I mean, I look at your Instagram feed all the time, and I mean, your knives have subtleties to them that that are that you are able to repeat and. So that's part of your design language. Where did all that come from? Just from, you know, your first, you're tweaking knives and now you're making these knives. Well, I mean, John Gray was pretty much my knife father. Um, he contacted mm-hmm. me one day and I, I'd always wanted to try grinding a knife. 
I didn't have a grinder, of course, and they're expensive. You know, they could be like, you know, a thousand to like five thousand dollars, you know. So John got a hold of me, came over and we hung out and I, you know, I went to his house and, you know, he had a grinder there. We tried it out and, you know, skip a couple of years later and I'm living with the guy. And uh, that's when I started to get out of the pimping knives and into making folders because John was making fixed blades and he was working on folders as a side project. And, um, you know, I planned my Tannic and I made a couple handmade knives. Some of them I have still. Hmm. But just from from customizing knives, I knew the ins and outs of, of how a knife function, like especially a frame lock. I knew it so well that I could actually make one by hand without any mills or anything like that. So I got the idea yeah. how to do it and basically went on from there and. And we got a hold of a guy that did water jet. And so we, we started the Tannic project, or I started the Tannic project, and uh, you know invested a bunch of money into it. And uh, the Tannics were pretty cool. I mean, they're big and bulky and crazy. Uh, but, you know, they were they were a lot of fun. And the, the, the knife customization stuff came through in there. I'm sure you noticed every one of them was like a pimp job, you know, after I, yeah, after yeah. I got the function down and everything like that. You know, it just turned into like fun and creativity. And, uh, and that was really fun for me. And the grinds were terrible in the beginning. But the thing was that my philosophy with those tannics were, you know, I was more into like fixed blades back then and like splitting wood with like big, big choppers yes. like Gavco. <laughs> and we all agreed that the best grind was like a convex grind for, for the choppers mm-hmm. and everything like that. Like a very, very shallow, uh, slight convex to your flat grind. Okay. So I wanted to apply that to a blade. So the Tannix all have a convex grind. I don't think people know that. Oh. Um, so you could, you could, you know, shove it in there and just start batoning a piece of wood. And it would, it would go through it nicely more than like, say, like a hollow ground knife I would make now or something like that. It would just stop. And, you know, those things were made to be beat to hell. Thumped yeah. up. You, you have a, a funny story about a customer that <laughs> reached out to you about a, a story about his Tannix. Tell me that Yeah, story. that was... Uh, yeah, this guy he wanted a tannic real bad, and uh, I made like a real special one for him. It was um, it was all titanium with bricks carved into it, and some of the bricks were actually small pieces of titanium bolted onto it to give like a really crazy industrial look. And uh, he he was kind of a friend, and uh, he we kind of lost touch, but he has tannic. He loved it. And one day he got in a car accident, and I guess his car flipped and went off a bridge or something into some water. And he told me that he woke up in the hospital and the first thing he did was he lo- he looked at the doctor or whoever was next to him was like, where's my Tannic? And I was like, <laughs> you're, you're kidding me. He's like, no, that's literally what I did. And then he went out there, I guess a couple days later, a few weeks later or something, he went out and I was like, oh, I may as well try and find it. So he went into the, the river that is crashed in or whatever. And he found the Tannic and it worked great. And uh, yeah, he was super excited and it was, you know, was n690 steel i think so it's it's pretty rust proof so you know you know i got it back i told him to send it back to me and make sure everything was good and not even no rust on it nothing i mean the thing was uh, still working just fine that that is not only a testament to uh, a customer's (laughs) love of your product but also of your product itself that it it survived the river in the car yeah i I mean i'm i mean i i do what I do, like, I'm kind of a type of guy that, like, hates a model after I'm done with it. You know what I mean? I don't hate it, but, like, some of the older ones, I'm just like, ew. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, yeah, not yeah, to yeah. Say pull myself well, or put down the Tannic or anything like that, but there was a couple that were just terrible. And, you're, well, you're an artist, yeah. and you came up through an, 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 an art education, yeah. as far as I know. And, and I understand that. You make a drawing, you make a painting. When you're done with it, it's done. You're done with it, unless you're going to live with yeah. it and decide how to make it perfect. So do you live with any of your knives? Do you ever carry anything that you make? No. <laughs> I used to. Uh, I used to make them once in a while. And I think the the thing about having a kid was that was the thing I had to sacrifice. I mean, there's a lot of other things I had to sacrifice. But as far as my business yeah. goes, I no longer have the pleasure of being able to carry my own knife pretty much. Like I, I used to have them. I'd never keep them ever, really. I would keep them for like two, three months. I think the longest I had one that I carried was about a year maybe. And uh, hmm. I eventually sold it, though. But I don't get to really carry them that often. I, you know, I know they work great and everything. And, you know, I know my parts well enough to know that, you know, what's what's what. I don't need to carry it for a year to know. Right, right. You don't, you're, you're not in a constant testing yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But just to, just to having to hold, no? No, I mean, you know, if I, you know, if I suddenly came into like 10 grand out of nowhere, then, yeah, I, I'd spend <laughs> a couple of days and make myself a knife, you know, so I could take a break. Yeah, yeah cause that's yeah. the thing though. Every knife is a paycheck for me. So if, if I, right. it's yeah, your yeah. so it's basically like I'm going to take my paycheck from work and put it in a drawer or carry it in my pocket for the next couple of weeks. Like, you just can't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But with the production models, it's pretty cool. I actually get to carry those around. So what's it, 
What's it like working with these production companies? Uh, working with, well, you just worked with Custom Knife Factory. You said that was kind of mysterious and cool. But you've worked with Arcform and um, Boker. And I, I know I'm missing so I know you did small projects with like Elijah Isham. Yeah, yeah. yeah the collabs and the uh, production stuff's a lot different. So w- what's it like on these uh, big production uh, jobs? I mean, the first one was Boker. I like it. I mean, it's... That was the word of yeah, right? yeah. the, the, your um, uh, friction folder. It's it's nice. I mean, it's it's different. You know, it's less personal than a than a collaboration, of course. But it's mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of nice to to have somebody you know to to have the type of respect I have in the knife community that people will actually come to me and say, "I'll make your model," and basically you do nothing and you get paid for it every few months. That's really nice. You know, that's kind of a, yeah. a goal. Like you know, a lot of these guys put out a ton of different collabs, and it's it's for one, it's really fun to do because it's really cool to see them make your knife. That's like one of the coolest mm-hmm. things ever. Um, but also just collecting a paycheck because it's a really nice bit of relief for most knife makers, I think, because, you, you know, it, it's you might get a thousand to fifteen hundred a knife, but you're spending, you know, 10 to 20 grand a month on supplies. You know, it's yeah, you know, it's crazy. Well, it's like getting a royalty check yeah. if you write a, a, a toothpaste commercial. Exactly. Or something. You yeah. know, and it's just, you know, as long as they get it right. And I really like the fact that people can get a hold of my knives that usually can't, you know, someone that couldn't afford a knife that expensive like myself. Mm-hmm. Yep. And especially with with the uh, Arcform and Custom Knife Factory, I mean, they did such a good job. I mean, it's literally like the same as my knife. It's it's really cool. Is it uh, better? I, I oh, know yeah. that's a terrible yes, question to ask. Yes. But... I mean, there's there's knife makers out there like uh, Brian Ado that will make a mm-hmm. knife that's like better than production quality. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying his production quality, but like, well, because he's the machinist yeah, and he's in his own like they're thing. making a ton of a ton of the same knife. He's making a small run that is perfected down to the the most minute detail with these machines. Mm-hmm. These machines are made yeah. just for small batches, so they're insanely nice. They're actually better than these. But you know, I don't have that kind of equipment. You know, so mm-hmm. you know, every knife is different than I make. I mean, I try to keep them to a certain standard. Um, some are, are smoother than others. You know, some lock up better than others. But that's just with every knife I've ever handled, pretty much. Well, that is the. I mean, I, I didn't mean that to be a, an obtuse question, but but that's the beauty of something handmade mm-hmm. is that each one is unique, and that uh, nothing's going to leave your shop if it's not working right. Yeah. But right is going to be different for each knife, yeah. you know, because each knife is its. Yeah, own. and 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 no matter what how good the quality is of a, one of these mid techs or production knives. They're never like, I won't like I could buy a couple different mid techs here and there, but they're never as cool as having the actual custom. Like, and that's, mm-hmm. that's for real, like not trying to be like stuck up. Like it, it doesn't nope. have the same feeling at all. And even carrying like this custom knife factory, it's gorgeous, but it's still, if I show it to somebody, you know, Oh, this is my knife. I make knives and I'd be like, Oh, this is your knife. I'd be like, well, it was made in Russia, but, <laughs> it's exactly my knife, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. It, it doesn't feel yeah. as cool. It's like a body snatching yeah. knife. It's it, like, it does yeah. feel cool to say that there's people in other countries making my knives. Um, yeah, really cool because your designs are so sought. And after. the really cool thing is when China makes it without permission. That's my favorite. I absolutely love that, oh, dude. So you, uh, I assume you're being 100. Uh, percent No, actually, that's actually, gotta be frustrating. actually, I absolutely love it, and because they're garbage and. The people that buy them are never going to buy my knives. So I don't really care. I find it to be like, I find huh? it to be funny, man. I mean, if someone's like, you know, really dipping into your market, like I think Rad Knives had an issue with where they were putting out his knives and people actually thought the cleaver, yeah, the big ass pe- cleaver, yeah. people thought they were his knives. And I think there was a couple of people that sold them for like his prices or something like that. I know it's like, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about what happened with him, but I know, you know, he right. was kind of newer to knife making. He got into it because he's an amazing machinist. And he's just like, I can do this and just like blows everybody out of the water. And so I don't think he knew like exactly what was going to happen when he got that popular that fast. So I think he was a little bit like, what the hell? And, you know, I talked to him about it. These knife guys are weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's up with these guys? But yeah, I mean, I, I, they made a Tannic with a Jason Stout blade. It was exactly uh. a Tannic handle exactly <laughs> to the last detail and then his blade from like i think a blood and thunder it was the strangest thing i've ever seen in my life that's just creepy it's like uh it's like something out of a weird japanese movie it looks in good though and i i, I was it? like hey let's do a collab and he was like no <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone <laughs> you know like uh well i have to say i'm getting my first custom knife in the next couple of weeks oh yeah it's uh it's someone um who's new to knife making that i interviewed recently uh douglas esposito he was at the monkey muster uh this year and he does fixed blades and they're beautiful like little gentlemen's uh assassin blades i don't know how else to to describe them but when i was talking to him i i sort of told him what i thought the 
the best combination of his blade styles and materials were. And uh, lo and behold, he has begun creating one for yeah, me. Nice. And uh, I, I'm really looking forward to having a, a 100% custom knife and a, a handmade knife. And I'm actually afraid of what it's going to do to me once I have it in hand. Well, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm excited just to have uh, something handmade. And I feel like that's kind of that's kind of the way I'm heading. Uh, do you think that this uh, this market for handmade and custom made knives, is this something that could have happened before now? Before, I mean, I know it happened in small. I mean, with the pricing being so crazy sometimes? Well, just, it just seems like there are a lot of makers and there's a thriving market for knives in is general. Is it thriving? Custom made knives. It, it seems like it is from the I don't. I don't know because I, I, I honestly like... I don't know like what everything is doing in the knife community anymore, like or what's mm -hmm. popular or what's not. Like some people say, like, "Oh, your knives are super hot right now." And I'm like, "Are they?" Like, <laughs> I'm not even being, I'm, I'm being serious. Like, I, I don't know these things. Yeah, I mean, all I do is work and, and hang out with my family. That's it. I mean, and right. I, I go on Instagram, and you know, people don't tell me things because you know, I would love if someone said, "Hey, your your knives are shit. You should do this with them instead." But nobody, the yeah. people won't say that to me. Everyone's like, "Yes, Jeff, your knives are so beautiful." Yeah, a lot of yeah. times, and, you know, like sometimes yes. I'll see people commenting, and I never let the comments go to my head because there'll be like thirty that are all like, "Your God" or something like that, and I'm like, "Okay, thank you, I appreciate that." But then I'll go on another guy's. Y'all going like uh, uh, CMF and like the same guy saying you're mm -hmm. God to him. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you can't, yeah, you can't let that stuff. I too many guys. Yeah, it's dangerous yeah. to ever let anything like that go to your head in any ways. So. No, but there is something to be said for it, for that endless scroll. And then coming across one of your knives, it's like, wow, that's on you. I've never seen that's. Uh, well, apparently you know, I broke the internet with my, my glow moon glow knife the other day. Yeah, yeah. So what's with this new model? It's 45,000 views on a video. That's really strange, not normal for me. Wow. Yeah, 45,000 views at this point and um about 150,000 requests to buy it. Uh -huh. really? Insane. Like I, that's the most popular knife I've ever made in my entire career, I think. And I hated that knife while I was building it. I hated it the whole time. Why? Cuz it was being a pain in the ass or because you didn't like the way I it didn't like the what? shape and I actually changed the the blade profile to a slight recurve which actually made everything come together at the end so very mm. end right before i hand rubbed it i put that slight recurve and it, it kind of just worked and then the hand rub made it so much better and the moon glow was at the very end i decided to put that in there i was like this is a material that is a joke to everyone for the last like 10 years and i always thought it was kind of cool if you use it subtly i put mm. it on there and i'm like i wonder what the hell people are going to say and then I also thought to myself, there's a bunch of people that never saw Moon Glow before because there's so many new collectors out there. And yeah. I guess it, I mean, I get requests for it now all the time, all of a sudden, but the material's not really that great. I mean, it's... Do you mean in terms of its long, la its durability? Um, you ever or? see those little stars that kids put on their ceilings at night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, yeah. same, same stuff. It's plastic. So it'll break, really. <laughs> it just cracks yeah. up in a couple So underneath years. the pivot, really slim and stout like that, it's not going to break. So I was okay with putting it there. Mm -hmm. um, the pit, the one in the the spider hole there. Who knows if it does break? I'll replace it. But it seems pretty sturdy. So the spider hole. I, I want to talk about this new model for a second. But the spider hole is that uh, something licensed? Oh, yeah, yeah. Every every year I pay them fifty bucks, and uh, you basically can just go wild with the spider hole as long as they're okay <laughs> with it. You know what I mean? Like, you give some. That's cool. I didn't know how that. Yeah, works, they they have to approve the 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 model. I mean, I've never heard of anybody mm -hmm. that wasn't, but I'm sure there's probably people that made some ugly, ugly shit, and they were just like, no. Uglier than spider Co <laughs> Oh, boy. Dude, that was everybody in the beginning when they first started collecting. spider Co is so ugly. And then I'm sitting there, like, <laughs> just waiting outside with my pants down for my spider Co to get to the mail. <laughs> <laughs> that was me, man. I, I mean. It's the beauty of imperfection. They're, they're, let's, let's they that. are something, man. They're they're beautiful. They, they, they take chances. You know, you got to give them that. They take chances yeah, with some yeah, of the, uh, yeah, sure. some of those out there models which i kind of like i was hanging on my phone for about a week and a half like a 13 year old girl waiting for the uh announcement for the new m4 jade yojimbo 2 which is my favorite spider spider co model i yeah, love have a that. couple of those um i don't understand that is that like a thing like everybody's like i keep seeing the jade yojimbo and i'm like no it, well no, no no it's just uh blade hq that when they do their exclusives oh, okay. with spider co it's always m4 steel and they use uh that that natural um j g10 natural g10 yeah, yeah. i did that way and back. i've never had I did that. that in the back of the and day I... before them <laughs> well i would <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> it took me a while to get cool and so i i, I finally got it and it's really cool and and now I, I i'm not even carrying or using it 
And when I say use, uh, my my use is very. Limited. Why not? Yeah, Jade's like uh, you can't make Jade look old or anything like that. That's tough, so. No, no, no. I I don't know. You, you know, I'm waiting for a, a different clip. I, I have a I have a clip on order that's going to come. I'm going to put that on. And uh, I get nerdy like that. Well, I would like to say something about a yeah. knife that I've been carrying and I'm absolutely excited about. It's the Joe Caswell CRKT. Um, oh yes, provoke. Yes. I saw pictures of this thing. And I was like, that's weird. And I didn't have any interest in it. And then one day I'm just like, uh, I could probably get the CRKT one from Blade HQ. And I did. And it is, uh, I mean, this thing is amazing, man. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to like toot another maker's horn, but I mean, this is insane. So describe it. Describe what it is. And and what problem it solves. I mean, I don't know what the hell problem it solves. It pro- the problem it solves is I need something cool right now. And like, this is the coolest <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> it, it, it ticks all the boxes of like, just it's, it's, you know, part like mall ninja. Cause you've got a karambit that's like for fighting, but he advertises it as like, you know, for a lot of other things, law enforcement. And when I got it, I was like, okay, I see it. I mean, the thing is built like a tank and I've never owned a CRKT before. And this mm-hmm. quality for 200 bucks is unbelievable. I mean, I'm definitely going to get the mid. They make good yeah, I'm gonna, I gotta say. I'm going to get the mid tech one if I can at some point. I already messaged the millet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I already messaged Joe Caswell and basically told him how amazing he was. And he was just like, thanks, dude. <laughs> 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 um, but I, I mean, it's exciting for me. I mean, I, I think it's exciting. It's a really cool design and it's, it's really satisfying to open and close it. And then like on top of that, he's got a clip that's different too, that just. I mean, it's it's really cool. Right? So, so for people people who don't know this knife, uh, it it's a karambit. It's a folding karambit, but it can't it can't fold onto your fingers. It it has this. Uh, it's got like uh, lever it's, design. You know what? It it, yeah. it kind of reminds me of like say you got like a robotic like spider or something like that. Like the legs, they kind of. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. I honestly think he may have gotten an idea from that. Like, cause it, uh, the way it hinges, I mean, if anybody knows what this is, I mean, if you don't know what this is, you're probably like, what the hell is he talking about? But I mean, the way it snaps open and the way it locks, it's very different. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. So are you a better knife fighter now? Oh yeah. 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 I've, I've taken out a few uh, zombies here and there in the last couple of weeks. Well, yeah. I mean, me and my, my Rick Grimes cult python. <laughs> you're, you're a giant python. So uh, who's, who's buying your knives? I'm I'm watching you every day on Instagram and every day it's spoken for or sold. Who who buys these gorgeous knives? Um a lot of guys in Russia, which is pretty cool. I mean there're a lot of a lot of really yeah. nice guys in Russia for some reason. I've I've always had a lot of customers in you know, out of Russia and um guys in one guy in the Ukraine especially has been buying my knives a lot. Uh, but pretty much it's just first come first serve. I mean, if I put up a work in progress and you say, "Hey, is this available?" Usually it is. Hmm. I don't do books because it's just as a one man show. It's it's very difficult to enter into a contract with somebody, mm-hmm. and especially with my erratic design behavior, where I can't do a design for more than like a week. Hmm. You know, doing the Tanix, I did have books, and I took like a hundred and fifty orders, and I at like number 60 or 80 or something like that, I, I did not ever want to see a Tannic again. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and I was just like, I can't, like, I, this is not fun for me. This is not what I wanted to do. This is a job now. This is boring. This is, I'm not inspired. And it, it just, yeah, you're making the donuts. Yeah. Now. It's just, it's just the same thing over and over. No matter how, I, how far I push myself to make something different, you know, they each had a specific idea of what they wanted and they all wanted the same thing that everyone else had. And, um, I luckily there was a good amount of people that were really cool about me just saying like, listen, I'm not making these tanks anymore. If you want a knife that I post, you're first in line. You know what I mean? So a lot of guys that, that came after that, like, Hey, I was on the tannic list. I check it. And you know, they'd get top billing for or top choice for whatever knife I made next. It was theirs. So you, you actually clipped off the list before you finished I, it. Dude, I, I knew that it would just, it would ruin me. I, I could You had to. Yeah. No, no, I yeah. understand that. Yeah. Those people who came after that were better off getting whatever you were making. At that I think they were happier yeah. than some bitterly made tank. Yeah. Although there's a, the, the Tannic has a cult following still, man. I mean, I posted a picture of one that I got back for a repair and people loved it. And I was just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it worked great and it was smooth and everything. And it, it weighed a ton. I mean, it was a freaking boat anchor, but I, I get it. You know, I, I still think it's cool, but you know, it's just. I'm not trying to be stuck up or anything like that. So, so now, okay, you're talking about the Tannic, and it was it was an overbuilt boat anchor kind of tough, hard use knife. Now, what are your goals? What are your design goals? Ah, uh, just sleek and nice, like smooth, sleek, and 
you know, I like gentleman carry knives, but like it's like a slight yeah. step up from a gentleman carry, like a little bit more rugged. Step up in terms of utility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as it, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like you have like a really nice, fancy looking like uh, art knife. You're, you're never going to carry that and use it. So I, I don't go too detail with the crazy inserts or anything like that. I wish I could, mm-hmm. but I don't have the machinery still. But yeah, more of a sleek look. A sleek design. I always like the old school mixed with new school. Like uh, Isham mm. did that. Um, I can't remember the name of it. The Pleroma. That's the one that you carry. Uh, yeah, that one too. But this guy. Oh, the the black star. Yes, I yes, believe yes, that's yes, yes. Yeah, this thing is like it's like an old case knife mixed with like a tactical folder, and it's yeah, that's a, f- a brilliant little. I, I haven't actually touched one, laid hands it on is one. Tiny. I, I would love to have a big Bowie knife with that blade. Yeah, I I, I almost was like, dude, I'm gonna make one of these really big. Do you care if I yeah. make a one? Yeah. But I can't. It's a beautiful blade. Yeah. And uh, speaking of which, you recently posted this giant kind of. Um, it almost looks like a proto cutlass thing yeah. that you're working on. It's a big, a big giant knife. What's Game that? Game of Thrones about? got to me, man. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, you know, like, dude, I'm I'm a huge fan of like Hatcher knives and like. Uh, oh God, this stuff is beautiful. Dan Keffler and like you know, the, you know, those knives I always go back to in my head. And making a full uh, fixed blade, like a big fixed blade, I haven't done it in a long time. And it's just a side project. I've been kind of tinkering with it after I work on my knives uh, during the day. And I've been adding to it and taking away stuff. And, mm. you know, just kind of a side project that I'm doing just for fun. And um, I got a guy that wants it. He's, he likes to buy my odd, weird fixed blades all the time. So I'm <laughs> like, you know, I don't know how it's going to turn out. So whatever. Your your fixed blades, uh, which I, I don't know if you've been posting them more in the last year or so or if i've only been paying more attention but they're beautiful for a while you're doing these little you're welcome uh little steak knifey looking things and then but i mean none of them look yeah, like they, they all look like i don't know steak knives that you might see in the game of yeah Thrones. they're like really tiny like skinny kind of yeah i mean i have like three of them in the kitchen actually the, I, when i do i do keep knives if you look at my knives in my kitchen i have like six kitchen knives that i made i don't think i've shown them really but I, yeah, you know, my wife loves them. That's that's you know. So I just make them out of whatever I have laying around, like scrap parts and stuff like that. I make nice kitchen knives out of them, and they're not great for kitchen knives. I mean, I don't make kitchen knives, so it's it's a different art right, form right. completely. Right. So with Tough Knives uh, as a company, where do you see yourself going? Are you going to go the route of uh, uh, Chris Reeve and and Hinderer and Strider? making custom things and having a small shop or like, you know, like what, what do you have in mind? For that was about? like the goal in the beginning. I think that was everybody's goal to like be a strider or a hinderer uh, mm-hmm. where you basically have your models in three different sizes and then you got a production version of it. So you basically could sell a bunch of knives and then have fun just making your custom knives. You know what I mean? Like, and it's just, you mm-hmm. know that, but I don't know. I think it's, you know, I, I still would like to do that, but it doesn't seem like a thing that people really do much anymore. Like you don't really see that ever have it. Cause the mid techs are here. And it right, kind right. of you, you farm that stuff out. Yeah, it, I mean, what what they were doing was kind of like mid techs, like made in in the in the U.S. with their oversight. You know, like actually they're doing some work too, which mm-hmm. is a little bit cooler than uh you know some of these mid techs. I mean, you know, they send them out. I mean, I don't know how they all do it, but like you know, especially the guys in China, like Riot and all that. I mean, most most makers aren't going over there and checking it out. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. They're getting yeah, samples. It's a bit of a hike, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and there's com- companies like Millet and stuff where they they do work closely with people. But yeah, I think it's different now. I think it's just um, I don't I don't know honestly. I mean, maybe one day I'll, I'll team up team up with another maker and do something. You know what I mean, mm-hmm. like that's always been kind of a thing in the back of my head. Like maybe we could do some kind of project. Uh, maybe me and Ian, like he's right down the street from me. So who's Ian? Uh, okay. CMF Knife Works. Oh, oh yeah, yeah Knife yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Wait, you, you, you kind of uh, showed him the ropes, I, I, right? He did. He worked with me in my shop for six months or so, and I mentored him and taught him how to do some things. And uh, he took that and got taught a bunch of other things from other people. And now he's yeah. making more money than me. <laughs> and they're gorgeous. I mean, I mean, I, I honestly feel like he, I don't know what the hell he did. Just one day, like I saw his knives and I was like, they're cool. You know, they're, they're like where they should be when you're starting out. And then one day, like he made this model overnight and it was like so much it like it was like a a two-year period of evolution in my designs he did like overnight like he went from chunky big stuff to like these really sleek and i'm i'm like wow that's damn dude you know what i mean like (laughs) like keep keep doing that please and he just does that and they've gotten nicer and nicer and of course he uses all the premium materials and i have no idea how he affords all that material but it's it's freaking sweet i aspire to buy the custom knives that you make now and when you get into that that level of collecting, I, I would imagine you're not even concerned about 
carrying crazy exotic material. You no, know, I mean, paint. dude, I mean, I, I mean, I freaking love Odie Green Micarta. Yes. I mean, it's like to me, it's more beautiful than Timascus. I'm, I'm, I know that's mm-hmm. weird, but like Timascus is great. I absolutely love it. I will still use it forever because it's just amazing. But when you're just doing a Timascus scale, I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, Ian now. I mean, I'm just saying like. Yeah. You know, he does the pivot work, which is insane. And like all the crazy details, he makes it work really nicely. It's not just, you're just run of the mill Timascus. But if you just do a Timascus scale, it's just a Timascus scale. I like to apply the Timascus in a different way or do something special with it. You know what I mean? And, 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 and you know what you're getting with the Timascus, you know, depending on your finishes. And I like to go back to the more, you know, rugged look, you know what I mean? Like I, I like the yeah. just plain tie a lot of the time. And, you know, I really like yeah. a, a, just a plain tie stone wash handle with a really nice Damascus blade. Yeah, uh, that's kind of something I don't see very often, but like it's I love that contrast of like fancy blade with just worker working finish handle. But yeah, like I, you know, I really wish people like G10 because um, it's one of my favorite materials to work with, uh, but nobody likes it. I mean, I put on if I put it on a knife, it just drops the value. Nobody. I mean, people just don't want it, man. I mean, what about what about how do people value my carta? I've been on a my carta kick getting a lot of custom scales. My carta is cheaper than G10 um, in a lot of cases. I mean, they're both pretty cheap materials, but I mean, and G10 is, you know, if you go back on my YouTube videos, you'll find a video of me and John Gray and, and Rant, Vance Rhodes torture testing G10 and carbon fiber. And in this video, I almost get shot by a crossbow from, from <laughs> John Gray. We were a little drunk, but uh, G10 held up better than carbon fiber and every other material <laughs> besides like titanium. So, you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, there's a classic look to my card I think that G10 doesn't have. It's kind of got that cold, sterile look. Yes, yes. And there's also a grippiness to my card that, oh, warmth. Yeah. When you, you, know, s- just, just when you sandblast G10, it brings out the um, grain to it. And I think it's just really nice. Well, maybe you're the man to bring it back, you know? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm working on C-Tech next and maybe Cure Knight, but, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Cure night, cure night. What's oh 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 right? I'm like I, yeah, I like cure night. It's good stuff, but yeah, C Tech never worked out for me. C Tech, that's a that hex. Yeah, it was interesting material, but structure. but you cannot put it on a folder. I, I don't like the way it looks. It makes me grip my teeth. It's like <laughs> tearing open a Nerf ball. Yeah, you know? I guess. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. Yeah, Something about it grosses me out. So let me ask you one last question, and maybe this is not the question to end on, but if you had to criticize your knives or your knife designs, illustrate some way in which you want to evolve your designs, how would, what would that be? I mean, for me, it's design before everything else, and I'd like to kind of change that a little bit because sometimes I ignore some some elements. Like a good friend of mine today actually messaged me because I knew what I was doing, and I knew I did this, and you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie and pretend that I didn't. But, you know, the blade was a little too wide for the handle. And it didn't stick out the back, but it was dangerously close. <laughs> but I knew that if I had taken away any material from that blade, it would lose the look I was going for. And, you know, like, this isn't, like, something I do often. But sometimes, on rare occasions, I'm just like, I don't care. I want it to be this way. <laughs> and, the aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, if there's an issue, I'll, I'll fix it. You know, I have no problem fixing it. But, you know, I've let stuff like that slide. I can't do that. You know what I mean? I have to make sure I don't do that ever because that was like a conscious choice, which was just a terrible idea. But, I mean, you, you, you made the conscious choice. Yeah. You chose art over safety. And, and you know, that's something that a, a knife buyer might have to, you know, suck up and accept. Yeah, but that, that's not a thing that I ever do. I mean, that's that's seriously like that was like a specific one that I was like aware. Right. And I even told him because I talked to him all the time. I was like, yeah, be a little careful there reaching in your pocket. But, you know, and I was like, I even said if there's an issue, just send it to me and I'll just, you know, I'll just grind it down there a little bit. And, you know, it'll probably look fine. But I mean, I think the idea of um, the the design first and function second, like I think I, I would like to focus more on one model or two or three models because so the prospect is taking over as one of the models I think I'll continue to make uh, the the larger prospect and the mini prospect. The mini especially is uh, I think it's good. I think it's it's at a point where I like it and there's multiple different options for it to keep me satisfied uh, for my creative wants and needs. Yeah, and and it seems like with the prospect you have you you've been uh, exercising a couple of options in blade shape. I mean subtle differences. Yeah, but yeah, like, very subtle. Seem- I mean the the slight like a slight recurve. Like this one is the first one I did with like a slight harpoon. It's very uh, Benchmade Onslaught or Bob Lum kind of looking. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, with the with the harpoon. With this oh, uh, right. this G10, or this not just G10, this uh, carbon fiber, if we could see this here. Ladies and gentlemen, tune in to uh, Tough Knives IG page to check this out. It's got the, 
the Tough Knives logo is all over it. How did you do I that? I didn't. I had this stuff for about 10 years. I had a uh, uh, the guy who made Black Slate Carbon Fiber back in the day. They're not around anymore. Uh, he uh-huh. made a bunch of that for me. I used to put the the glow the glow powder in there and like glue epoxy. So it, 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 if you go way, I don't even know where the hell to find it, but I did it on a couple of fixed blades. But yeah, I'm just using that material. I'm not actually going to keep those logos on there, but. I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah, that yeah. is pretty cool. I mean, I love that that blade shape. Yeah, I'm I'm liking these ones. I made these. I made both of these knives that I posted today in record time. I don't usually do that, but I did two two knives today, uh, both functioning and ground, which is really strange for me. I think it's because I bought that python yesterday, which is really stupid of me to do. So I was like, All right, so you, you have to you have to justify yeah. it with some good hard. Yeah, work. I got up at like five a.m. and I worked till about five, and I got two knives almost finished, which is. I, I feel delirious right now. <laughs> so if I'm a little weird on this uh, podcast, I apologize. So uh, th- that's a perfect way to wrap up, Jeff. How how can people find you, find your designs, find your knives, and and connect with you, connect with you to to buy some of your beautiful handmade? Usually, knives. I'm at this bar down the street, just kind of hanging out. If you want to just go <laughs> in there, uh, mostly Instagram uh, for now. Uh, tough knives on Instagram. DMing me is it usually works. And if you want one of my knives, best thing to do is like get them when I post a work in progress picture. That's usually when the it's the easiest to get it. Yeah, reach out while it's still in yeah, progress. Yeah, it's kind of a work in progress. I will not be going to play this year, unfortunately. Um, still trying to figure that out with my financial situation. It just seems like a very hard thing to do with with the yeah. child and everything and all the bills. So right. yeah, yeah, I put yeah. my wife through college right, or classes to be a vet. So it's a little tough, but no. you know, no biggie. It'll pay off in the end. Well, Jeff Blauvelt, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Oh, thanks for having it's me. It's been a pleasure talking to you for the second time. I wish we were able to capture that first time, but hey, second time's a yeah. charm. Or yeah. third, whichever. Been- <laughs> <laughs> Great talking to you, sir. Uh, you too. Ever order a knife online and have it delivered to the office so your wife doesn't know? Chances are you're a knife junkie. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast, Bob. Um uh, you know, just a, a, a good conversation there with Jeff. And again, thanks to him for being on the podcast again, <laughs> even <laughs> though our listeners will only have heard it for the first time. Yeah. But uh, what what was your thoughts? What was your main takeaway or thing that kind of struck you the well, most he, in this kind of conversation? He's just real salt of the earth. And, and he's proof that hard work and, uh, you know, perseverance leads to some sort of legacy. I just think his work is starting to speak for itself. And, uh, you know... He definitely expressed the frustrations of being a one man shop, but also mm-hmm. you can tell he's an artist who loves toiling, mm-hmm. uh, you know, toiling in obscurity, if you will. <laughs> so, oh, well, maybe not some obscure, no, not so much obscurity. Right, right. But he's alone in his shop and he's yeah. turning out amazing work. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Maybe one day, Bob. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's tease next week's episode. What can uh, listeners uh, uh, look forward to next week? Well, uh, another sort of uh, knife making outfit on uh, that's in the vanguard, if you will, kind of changing things and making uh, making custom knives more accessible to to the hoi polloi such as myself. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to be speaking with uh, Chris and Elliot Williamson of Ferrum Forge next week, mm-hmm. and they've just been. Uh, I mean, they've had a thriving custom career for uh, about 10 years, but in the last couple of years, they've just been reaching a gigantic market with their uh, collaborations with Mass Drop and we. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about some of that stuff. The knives keep on coming. That's right. That's how we roll on the Knife Junkie podcast. So for Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. I want to thank you for listening to yet another episode of the Knife Junkie podcast. Look forward to seeing you back here again next week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 